every single campus is He our living hope. He's not our dead hope. He's not a buried hope. He's a living hope. Praise God. We love you, Father. We thank you today to be in your house. Thank you for your church from the, the coast of South Carolina up to the upstate, all along the Savannah River, up near Charlotte. We are saying loud and clear at New Spring Church that we are here to worship you, Jesus Christ. You are what it's all about. You are our living hope. Praise Him one more time with a good hand clap and a shout. Awesome. Why don't you go ahead and take a seat, take a seat. It's good to see you, church. Hey, would you help me uh, thank our worship teams, these guys and gals every single week come and they serve, the production team, we're grateful for them. Hope you got your elements on the way in this morning. We'll get to that at the end of the service. I want to invite you to go ahead and uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 1. And uh, we'll be there in just a moment. If you've got your app open, you can open it up there. We've preloaded all of the notes there. And I'm excited about today. While you're turning, i got to ask you a question. Have you ever had to call 911? <laughs> Whoa. Now, I'm not talking about like the accidental 911 call when you're like sitting on your phone uh, and you hit that emergency button. I was mowing the grass one time, had a police officer pull into our driveway, and uh, he's like, somebody called 911. I said, I don't think so. Maybe one of the kids, and I had been sitting on the call 911 button in my, in my pocket while I was mowing the yard. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about have you ever had to call 911 for something serious? And uh, I have. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you about one of the stories when this occurred. It was the start of my junior year of college. We've got a lot of college students coming back, so I just want to say welcome. We'll mention this later. If it's not already been mentioned, we've got a college gathering on Tuesday night uh, for rally coming up. But when I was in my junior year of college at Furman University over in Greenville, I, I was living on campus there. Everybody had to live on campus back then. And I was living at the very back of where you lived on campus. It was the fall of the year, and uh, I was an early morning person. I had to be up early for, for the sports teams that I was on anyway, so I went ahead and always took early morning classes. And being on the very back of campus, I ended up for the first time ever getting a bike to ride to class. And so I would ride a bike to class every single day, and in the fall of the year, and college students, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe some of y'all remember this. Uh, you would figure out kind of who was on the same schedule as you when you were going to class. So you'd figure out who's like on my Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, who's my Tuesday, Thursday people, and you'd see the same folks. Well, at the very back of the, the, the campus where I was at Furman, uh, there was another guy who I always met at the bike rack because he had early morning classes, and uh, I'm an extrovert in case you couldn't tell, right? If you're at Anderson, you know this. I stand outside. My favorite thing is to say hello to people on the way into church every single week, but um, I wanted to introduce myself to this guy. He was about six foot six. He, he, he had long hair, uh, and he had glasses, and so he and I always ran into each other at the bike rack every single morning. There was only one problem. He wasn't an extrovert. I guess he was an introvert because every single day he would come to the bike rack. He already had his earphones in his ears, and I could hear the music that he was playing. It was like this screamo, double bass, heavy music. I don't know if you've ever heard it. It kind of sounds like this. And you know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all listen to that by chance, a couple of us? Okay, maybe while you're lifting weights. So he didn't want to visit me. I was like looking for my chance to get to know him. Hey, man, we got the same class. We ride beside each other on our bikes to the dining hall every single morning. And, uh, and eventually I knew he would crack. He was going to get to smile or say hello, and I would, I would uh, extrovert my way into a conversation. Uh, he also rode his bike the same level of intensity that he listened to that music. So he would get on his bike and he would rah, 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 all the way to the dining hall. And I would, you know, be right beside him. Anyway, you get the point. Well, this one morning, it's, it's kind of that first fall crisp morning of the year. You know, the ones that are coming up here in just a few couple of weeks. We're all waiting on it. It was one of those mornings I come out and I am, I am ready to go to the dining hall, get some coffee. I'm a bird chirping kind of early morning person, Right. Uh, song in my heart, that's just who I am, okay? My kids, I do this to them every morning, but that's what I'm doing. I'm coming out of my apartment, and I can hear my friends already beat me down to the bike rack. I haven't seen him yet, but I can hear his music. So I get there, and he's kind of getting his bike off. He's going. I get my bike off, and I'm following. I'm probably, I don't know, 40 feet behind him, 50 feet behind him. We're jumping across the parking lot like we do every morning, and he's riding fast with intensity, and he's jumping up on the curb, and he's jumping down the parking lot, and we're coming across campus, boom, 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 boom. But when he jumps up on the last curb and tries to jump down to the next spot in the parking lot, 
I don't know what happened. All I saw was he jumped down and his shoes that were on his feet flew over his head out into the parking lot. It looked like maybe the axle on the front wheel of his bike just broke. By the time I got to him, there was a puddle of blood the size of the parking space. I am not exaggerating. There was so much blood on the ground I could smell it. I'm there within three seconds. As soon as I got there, I knew I had to call 911. I slide in, throw my bike down. I'm dialing 911. 911, we've had a bike wreck. We're in the, well, yeah, here's where we are. Here's our location. Here's all I know. He's knocked out. Yeah, right. Please hurry. Please hurry. Please hurry. We're on the way. Click. I get down, and I don't know what to do. I mean, other than to pray for this guy, there's a young lady that saw the wreck from across the apartment complex. She's running towards me. I can remember her face because she sees how much blood is there, and she immediately turns around and just is trying not to get sick. All I knew to do was pray. I put my hands on his back. I start praying for him. And I mean, I'm praying, every Lord, be with him. I don't even know his name. Help him. Uh, Lord, please don't let him die. I mean, this was intense, okay? The, the EMS people get there pretty quickly, but before they do, he starts to wake up. He pulls his hair and face out of the blood, and he asks me, what happened? And he has no teeth in his mouth. The glasses that he was wearing are smashed into his face. And his jaw was all kinds of busted. And all I told him was, you've had a wreck. Don't move your neck. Help is on the way. And I just start praying for him. A crowd gets there by the time the EMS arrives. They put him on a neck brace, neck board, zip him off to the hospital. Off he goes. I can remember them taking water and trying to wash the blood out of the parking lot. And it just poof, all over the parking lot. For the rest of the year, I drive by that dark spot in the parking lot. And it would... I, I, if you're at Furman, go by today. It's probably still there. It's in between buildings J and I. It's still there. Huge spot in the parking lot. I didn't have any appetite to go eat breakfast, so I just kind of slowly rode my bike to my first class. And I remember sitting in that class after I'd witnessed this, not knowing if he was, how bad hurt was he? Is he alive? Is he, I didn't know. I mean, it messed me up completely mentally for some time because I just didn't know how bad he was hurt. I, one day, Turned into two, two days, two to two weeks. I hadn't heard anything. I didn't know, I didn't even know his name to ask about him. By the time we get to the end of the semester, I end up running into him in the parking lot. He's moving his things out of his apartment. He's had to take a year off. And he, I, I introduce myself. He's had 18 surgeries, y'all, to fix his eyes, his nose, his jaw, his teeth, what was going on. But he's alive. I, and had, I had no idea what, how bad hurt he was. And got to introduce myself and say, I was there that morning, you wrecked. I called 911. I'm so glad you're okay. It was unbelievably intense. Why in the world are you opening up with that story? Well, the reason I'm opening up with that story is that is what the book of Galatians is. The book of Galatians is Paul writing a 911 letter to the church. It's that level of urgency. Now, before we get into the text, we're going to read chapter 1 in just a moment. You're going to see how serious it is, how urgent it is, how important it is. But I've got to ask a question. What happens if I don't call 911 that morning? Now, maybe somebody else would have gotten there eventually, and they would have seen it as well. But I know what would have happened. We're talking casualties. And I want you to know that's exactly what happens if Paul doesn't write this letter. We're talking casualties. Spiritual casualties are going to um, be all over the, the city of Galatia. And so as we jump into this text here in just a second, I want you to feel that because this is Paul coming up on a scene that is, that is 911 level. And he's going to speak with 911 intensity and 911 seriousness. And I want you to know all six weeks of this series are, are going to be good news. But it's good news because there is some places and spaces we've got to watch or we will see the enemy distract us and deceive us and distort us even while we're here in the church. He does it all the time. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to open it up to Galatians 1, like I said. And, and I'm going to read to you the first six verses of Galatians chapter 1. Okay, um, excuse me, six verses from 6 to 12. Okay, here is Paul, 911 letter of urgency. Here's what he says. He says, church in Galatia, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning, look at this, to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we 
or an angel from heaven, think about that, an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to, contrary to the one we preach to you, well then let them be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or am I seeking the approval of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that we, was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you feel the intensity of this? Like if you read any of Paul's letters to the other 12 people he wrote or churches he wrote to, you're going to see all this introduction, ramp up language and uh, grace and peace to you and all this kind of flowery stuff. He, he doesn't quite tell any, a, a joke at the front of it, but he's at least trying to warm people up. He does not do that with the Galatians church because it was 911 emergency. Urgent, urgent, urgent. So here's what I want you to jot down if you're taking notes. The reason he does it, the reason it's a 911 call is because getting the gospel right is a huge deal. Now, again, I'm going to preach with intensity because our world is living with intensity right now. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. Are you okay with that at 915 this morning at New Spring Church? It's a huge deal. We've got to get the gospel right. It was such a big deal. And they had missed it. They had missed it. And here's, here's two reasons that we've got to make sure that we get the gospel right as well, okay? It's a big deal, but two reasons, two things that happen when the church gets the gospel right. Number one is if the church gets the gospel right, check this out, people start to experience the saving power of Jesus Christ. That's real. That's not theoretical. That'll change your eternity. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your career. It'll change your family. It'll change your legacy. It'll change your city. It'll change the state of South Carolina. If the church gets the gospel right, everything changes. Say amen with me. Come on, somebody in New Spring. Amen. The church gets the gospel right. Everything changes. Now, here's the other piece that we've got to catch. But if we get the gospel wrong, the exact opposite occurs. People think because of the language we use and the, the borrowed Christianese that we speak in, that they've, they've got salvation or they've, they've got it all figured out. And, and then ultimately, the reason Paul writes this letter is because he didn't want people to be fooled into not getting the gospel and miss out eternally. This is an eternally significant deal. So the church, us, New Spring, we've got to get the gospel right. Now, let me back away and give you a little cultural context. Galatia is as a region in modern day Turkey. So you can still find it on the map today. And um, most scholars believe that this is one of the earliest letters that we now find in the New Testament. So on chronological timeline, this was written more than likely, most think around 16 years after the ascension of Jesus, okay? So Jesus defeats sin and death, establishes his church, tells them I'm coming, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to heaven and prepare a place, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit helper. You go and make and baptize and teach people the good news about me. And they stand there and they watch him go up into the air, into, into heaven and ascend. And then the church is started just a few days later when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. 16 years later is when this moment, this letter is written, 49 A.D., so in that 16-year period, the church was birthed, was started, was trending, but then somehow, somewhere, it got distorted and it got disoriented and it became a church that followed a different gospel. Now question, all right, if that can happen in 16 years, what do you think's happened over 2,000 years? That's, that's the point of this, this book. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said this was his favorite book in the Bible. And you can imagine, because the church gets distorted. It gets, somehow, some way, we get, we get distracted. Politics gets involved, and, and our agenda gets involved, and other things in our life get involved. And, and we need to make sure that we have got our eyes set and our hearts calibrated on the gospel. That's what we are going to be talking about in the next six weeks. And it's going to be incredibly encouraging. Because when, when the church gets the gospel right, people experience the saving power of Jesus. The second thing that, that happens when the church gets the gospel right, I love this one. I'm prepping you for a hallelujah, an amen, a hand clap, a, a praise the Lord. You ready? When the church gets the gospel right, God is glorified. Yeah, God gets glory, right? I mean, and we've tried to emphasize this today a lot. I hope you feel it at your campus too. But Jesus Christ, 
the risen Savior and Lord, is the front page above the fold headline at New Spring Church this Sunday and every Sunday. We want to glorify him. We want to make it about him. We don't want to make it about anything else, no other agenda, no other uh, thing. We want to make it about him, primary and of first importance. It's a big deal. No secondary issue. we got to make sure we lift that up at the highest level. And these service touchstones, these service, these service places that we can sense and see if we are getting the gospel right. So just, I'm, I'm going to say it again. People experience the power of salvation, not just I got saved one time, but their entire life changes, their families change, their careers change, their purpose changes, everything changes, and God gets glory. Those are great touchstones to know if you're getting the gospel right. But now, the million-dollar question at 915 on this early uh, service today is very simply this. So what's the gospel? What is the gospel? Hey, if you're taking notes, um, I want you to write that question down, and I'm going to give you like 15 seconds to write a couple of words. What do you think it is? Like it's important. Paul wrote this whole letter. Well, what do you think the gospel is? We say that word a lot. It is kind of in the language of, of Southern Americans. It's in the language of church people. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. What is it? If like we came live to your campus this morning and your campus pastor came down and made eye contact with you on like wherever you're sitting, wherever you are, and said, hey, Joe, we want to ask you what the gospel is and put you live on the mic for all 14 campuses, what would you say? Think about that for a moment. What is the gospel? What is it? So important. And we're going to rally around um, this essential definition of the gospel for the next six weeks because we want you to know the gospel. We don't want you to have to second guess because you know what? It is so important that you know the gospel because the people at your job, they might not know the gospel and you might get to share it with them. Uh, college student, maybe you just got your roommate via potluck. That's what we used to call it, potluck. And, and they came from wherever and you came from wherever and you're at church today and maybe they're sitting with you and they were maybe gonna ask you over lunch today as you're hanging out catching some tacos at lunch today, hey, what's the gospel? Tell me how it changed your life and you're gonna be able to answer it. Or maybe you're gonna meet somebody in your sorority or in your fraternity this year. Or maybe somebody that's gonna move into your neighborhood. Lots of people moving right now. Realtors everywhere, okay? Lots of people moving. What is the gospel? Could you answer the question? And let me give you a working definition. This is what we'll use the entire series at New Spring Church. It's going to be on the screen. I want you to read it with me. Here's what it is. The gospel is the good news. The good news what? That Jesus died for our sins and he rose from the dead so that through faith in him, we can be made right with God and enjoy life with him forever. I'm going to read it one more time because I want you to catch it. It's got all the essentials in there. The gospel is the good news. It's not bad news this morning at church. It's good news. It's good news that Jesus died for our sins, my sins, not my theoretical sins, but my sins. He died in my place and in yours. And he rose from the dead, defeating sin and death, so that through faith in him we can be made right with God and enjoy life with him forever. That's the gospel. Now, we can distort it and deceive it, and in, in the book of Galatians, they did. They, they, they essentially believed the historical account of what Jesus had done, but you're going to hear more about this over the next couple of weeks. But some religious people came in and wanted to deceive and distort. They were called the Judaizers. Basically, what they were saying was, yeah, you should believe in Jesus, but you also should hold on to all of the law of the Old Testament. And so all you Greek men, all you Greek men that are wanting to follow Jesus, that's awesome. You can follow Jesus. We just got to talk to you about being circumcised. Ooh, you guys groaned a little bit more there, more than you did when I told the 911 story of blood right there. Uh, can you imagine this? What if today at every single campus, we're not talking to you about connect class, but we're talking about, hey, you want to follow Jesus? That's great. Oh, you're not Jewish? Great. We've got a circumcision class right after the 915. If you don't know what circumcision is, you should be in Kid Spring. Okay. Um, so. But, but listen, that, that's what they wanted to do. The Judaizers were saying, oh, you can follow Jesus. You can be saved. You just got to continue to follow the law. And Paul will say later, you'll feel him say, absolutely not. Jesus Christ died not to invite you into the, 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 the covenants of the law that you've got to hold, but he's, he's the one who actually fulfilled it himself so that you can do nothing but receive and follow him. He's going to remove the burden of all the rights and wrongs. It's good news, not bad news. All right, adult circumcision, bad news. Following Jesus, good news. Okay, enough of that. All right? Now, here's what I want you to catch right here before I, I've got to tell you a story. I want you to write down the words kind and, and I want you to write down the words nice. 
kind and nice. We're going to talk about them in just a moment. Because, because what I want you to know is that Paul, when he writes this, Paul is kind. Paul is unbelievably kind. Not nice, but kind. Let me tell you how uh, I'm distinguishing the difference. When uh, my wife and I were just dating, I was already on staff. I was a youth pastor here at New Spring Church. She was a college student at Clemson. We would started dating. One of, the, one of the moments that I knew, Corey Cooper you, well, you weren't Corey Cooper then, Corey O'Toole, uh, you are going to be uh, my gal, all right? And then I'm going to go all the way in on dating this young lady. Was We had been out to date several times, a couple of months now. We had gotten past kind of the awkward starting to date stage. We're sitting at dinner one night, and uh, we've had dessert, and we're just kind of talking. And I'm like, you know, staring at her big blue eyes, and, and I'm, just, I'm just excited that we're, she's dating me, and she's beautiful, and she's staring right back at me. And, and, uh, and I'm thinking maybe she's thinking the same thing. But about that time, she asked me this question. She said, hey, can I ask you something? Said, yeah, ask me something. She says, do boys, I don't know if this, do boys, do boys buy tweezers? So no, Y'all hear the ladies laughing? Okay, fellas. I mean, I mean, I think I got a pair somewhere to get like splinters out of my hands from once in a while. I don't know. I said, like, I mean, I think I got a pair. What do, you, what do you mean? And she goes, Well, it's just that. Is it? Can I be honest with you? Yeah, be honest with me. Be honest with me. You kind, you, you got an eyebrow, and you're supposed to have eyebrows. And, and are you, if you just, if you have a pair of tweezers, you just kind of pluck right there above your nose to make two. Not, not like a Bert and Ernie one. You get two right there. That's, and, 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 and the boys know that. And I'm like, <laughs> And at first, you kind of have to be like, wait a minute. I've never had anybody, no girl has ever gone there. But it wasn't from a space of being mean. It's just, and if you know my wife, you know this to be true, is that she, she's got such a kind heart, she just wants to make sure you know that there's something that could be of benefit to you. Now listen, if she was nice, would she have done that? Absolutely not. Because nice people lie to you. There's a lot of nice people in our world today. There's a lot of nice people at your office. There's a lot of nice people that you can talk to about your dating life. There's a lot of nice people you can talk to about maybe if you should get out of your marriage. There's a lot of nice people that will talk to you. Listen, this is the scariest thing. There's a lot of nice preachers. There's a lot of nice churches. And that's so scary. And here's the point. Paul writes to the church of Galatia, and he has so much love in his heart because he knows eternity is real. That he cannot afford to be nice, but he will absolutely be kind. And so the letter of Galatians is a kind letter. It's from a pastoral heart full of a, full of a shepherd that cares about the eternity of people and cares about the way they're living their life. And so he is not going to be nice. And our people out in the world today will be nice. Politicians will be nice. People will take offense to everything. I know it. I live in that space. But I am begging you, one, surround yourself with kind people. And make sure that you are a kind person that can be trusted in the relationships that you're in. Love someone enough not to lie to them and tell them it's going to be okay. The Old Testament was full of nice prophets, by the way. No, everything is fine. Everything is fine. And everything is not fine. And Paul wrote and said, no, 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 you can't just kind of take some of the, the things that Jesus did and just kind of merge it in with your spirituality and it's going to be okay. Absolutely not. 911, there's going to be a casualty. You've got to know the gospel. And it is going to offend. Can I say that to you? It's going to offend. You and I are not good enough. We've got to swallow that. We cannot Make ourselves good enough. We can't know the rules and achieve high enough. The gospel is the very fact that you and I cannot make ourselves right with God. We can't write a big enough check. We can't perform enough action. We can't attend church enough. We can't read our Bibles enough. We can't be kind to children enough. We can't do anything that will make us right with God because sin has fractured that relationship. And nobody, it seems, wants to talk about that anymore in the church. And it hurts me pastorally. 
But the bottom line is we can't afford to just be nice and lie to people and then get Matthew 7. Jesus is talking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and he says to these people at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, many are going to show up on that day, on the day, and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we know you? And he's going to say, I, you're going to have to depart from me. I never knew you. Man, that keeps me awake at night, the fact that I know I'm going to stand before the Lord on whether or not I told you that, whether we shepherded you that way. And I am not okay being a nice pastor. We're going to be kind preachers at New Spring. We're going to be kind as a church. We're going to be kind and loving. We're going to be full of love, but we're going to also be full of truth. And we are not going to separate those two. Is that okay with you? We have to do this, church. We've got to do this. Now, what we've got to understand is, is that Jesus did this all the time. Go read the Bible. It'll blow you away. Next week, by the way, we're starting in the book of Proverbs tomorrow morning. If you want to jump in with us, Proverbs chapter 1 is tomorrow in our year of the Bible. You can jump back in if you've fallen off. Jump back in. But if you go and read the, the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just look at how Jesus operates, you're going to see him be kind. Do y'all remember the story of the rich young ruler? Do y'all remember that? The rich young ruler is coming after Jesus. Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, I've, I've kept the commandments. What do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus says, Hey, that's awesome. You're really close. Go and sell everything. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Because Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew that he still had some things in his heart. And he wasn't going to be nice to him. He was going to be kind. And you know what the, the rich young ruler did? He didn't go empty the bank account. The Bible says that he walked away sad because he had many things. And he put his back to the Lord of the, of the world. And he walked away. Now here's what I want to make sure we all catch. This is crazy. Jesus doesn't grovel. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Just go maybe, maybe half. Just sell, give half away. and come, That'll be good enough. You're kind of showing good faith. And, come, and you can come and follow me. Just may, maybe just buy one widow's meal. One widow's meal and then come and follow me. He, do, he doesn't do this there. He doesn't do this there. Because he's, he's told him what he needed to hear. And this, this is so practical Young believer in the room, you need to catch this because I'm telling you this is such a big deal right now. If you're under the age of 30 right now on every campus, I want you to hear me. We have never lived in a more accessible moment to getting sermons to you, to getting preaching to you, to getting books to you. I mean, some of these folks in the room, they'll remember the way you only got, you got your Sunday sermon growing up from your pastor, and if you wanted to buy some cassettes, you could buy some cassettes from somebody, right? And then occasionally you had a TV preacher or Billy Graham was on the big TV, whatever. But right now, man, you can listen to thousands of sermons, every single week, and it's incredible. I listen to so many, but here's what people do. They collect inspirational preachers, and they do not submit themselves to any correction. Our world is full of people that want their preaching, and their, their and listen, that, that, it's good news. You need to be inspired, and Jesus inspired, but Jesus would not step away from correction to sell himself out for inspiring. Listen, he was not simply just trying to build a big crowd. He was trying to build big people. He's building big people. He's building big people. And right now in this COVID moment, it's hard to build a big crowd all over the world. I'm telling you, this is what God is doing in the earth. He's building big people. He's building big people because there's going to be another moment when we get to see another thousands, tens of thousands, I believe, come to faith in Jesus Christ. But you've got to know the gospel for that moment. Because it's not just going to be on a Sunday morning with a good preach. It's going to be because you're sharing it at your school or in your home or in your, your cul-de-sac. You're sharing it in your apartment complex. So you've got to know the gospel because God wants to make you a big Christian. He wants that for you. So Jesus doesn't grovel after the rich young ruler. He doesn't do that either with the, the woman in John chapter 4 at the well. Remember that story? He doesn't do that. He loves her enough to tell her exactly what her sin is, loves her enough to tell her, and then she ends up receiving that, going and preaching the gospel to the whole town. She became a big person. And she was the one that ends up sharing the gospel with everybody back in the town. And you remember the statement Jesus made to his disciples? They were actually debriefing with him after she left to go back into town. And, and they're going, what are you doing? You're speaking to a woman. We've got a woman series coming up this fall. You're going to love it. You're speaking to a woman, Jesus. What are you doing? He says, listen, listen, pray for workers. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then he points as she is leading hundreds of people out of town. Look at the fields. They're white for the harvest. Get ready. 
Get ready. And so right now I'm saying to you, New Spring Church, get ready, get ready. There's so many people that are looking for good news in a world full of bad news, but we cannot settle for just being inspired. We've got to receive good gospel that corrects us and encourages us and aligns us and calibrates us, and that's what we're going to do in this series. I hope, I hope, I hope that you will not miss a single week because I think it's important. It's so important. It's so important. Now, as we transition, what we're going to do to conclude our service, because it's one of the most practical things that we have the opportunity to do all the time, is to receive communion. And so you got elements when you came through the doors at your campus. I want to go ahead and invite you to do that. Because you know what communion does? It calls to mind and memory the gospel for each one of us. It's no longer their story or their issue or their thing. It's our story. You know, Jesus, the Bible says on that night, before he went to the cross, he, he broke the bread and he would give it to his disciples. And he said, the same way I'm breaking the bread, I'm going to be broken. I'm going to be broken for you to make you whole. So I'm going to be broken so that you could be whole. And I just want to say to you this morning, would you receive this communion knowing that Jesus Christ broke himself on a cross for you? And if you would do that, then right now, right here, I want to invite you to take this bread and let's do this in remembrance of him. And then the Bible says after dinner, he poured the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Not the old covenant. I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. I'm going to pour myself out just like this wine in this cup for you. I'm going to bleed for you. This blood is powerful. It's powerful enough to make someone who's a slave of sin become a son or a daughter of God. It's power enough, powerful enough not just to, to pay for your sin past, but listen to this, church. It's powerful enough to break any hold on your life, sin present. And ultimately, the blood of Jesus is going to remove all sin in the future. So right now, today, would you take the cup and let's thank the Lord for his blood. It changed every single one of you to our king. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to go into a song called The Truth. It's basically a, a beautiful song of John, chapter 14, verse 6. It says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That might not feel nice, but I want you to know it's incredibly kind. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through the broken body and the spilt blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what's been put on offer for you today. So maybe today you received that for the very first time. Maybe today you recalibrated to that truth. So, Father God, as we worship you now on all of our campuses, would you be glorified? Lord, I pray that you would minister to each one of us, just like we received again the bread and the cup. Would you remind us of where we were and where, where we would be without the gospel good news of Jesus Christ? Thank you for loving us enough to be kind. And, Lord, I pray that we would be a kind people, that we would remember what your word tells us in Romans chapter 2, that the kindness of the Lord leads us to repentance, not the niceness of the Lord. That we would remember what you said in Proverbs, even as we read it this week, that, that the wounds from a friend can be trusted. We need kind people in our lives that love us enough to tell us when we have a unibrow. And so God, would you do that for your church because we are ready for the harvest that is plentiful. But we know you're making big Christians so that we might be able to be workers in your field. We honor and glorify you as we worship now. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, church, I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet at every campus. But before we just run forward into singing, all morning, I love how Tad, even in the worship set before, just invited us to slow down. So often I think we just miss the real gospel because we're too busy to catch it or too rushed to experience it. So before we start singing, I'm just gonna invite all of us to take a minute of quiet.